Hello and welcome to the Upper Pen Podcast. My name is Dakota and today I'm talking with Rachel Gillig about her first book, correct? It is. Mm -hmm. And it's called One Dark Window. Uh, So a little background, I read this on NetGalley before it came out and I read it in a single day and then I was really mad at myself because it wasn't even out yet and I would have to wait so long for the sequel. (laughs) Uh, apologies but you are not the only one who has experienced that um, and I feel like it's hard because on net galley you can't always tell if it's the first of a series um yeah I was super stoked though like now I just can't wait and I'm excited to see what else you come out with so thank, thank you. you yeah <laughs> um so for people who haven't heard about it tell us a little bit about one dark window yeah, um, One Dark Window, as you said, is my my debut, my first book. It's the first of um, a duology, so there's going to be a sequel. And it is a gothic fantasy about a maiden with a, a monster living in her head, and um, she kind of gets embroiled in a, a, a quest to collect 12 magical cards, um, there's treason involved, there's romance, there's high stakes, there's all sorts of fun stuff so yeah it's very fun and it has so much going on but you never neglect Elspeth the main character which I really love (laughs) yeah she (laughs) she goes through a lot and uh, (laughs) she does it's, it's, it's a lot for Elspeth and um yeah I I try I think I was very happy that I ended up choosing to do first person perspective for Elspeth so that we could like literally get in her head but um and uh yeah I I'm happy with how that all worked out did you play around with second or second person or anything I thought about doing third person um sometimes first person can be hard because especially in like high fantasy where you have to build the world you have to build everything and so then to just be with one person and just their perspective of it can be a little narrow however um it i i thought about doing third person but it didn't make as much sense when she was talking to the nightmare and having like a voice in her head it just it just had to be from her first person and um yeah i'm happy i did I really like it, um, how she has these internal conversations, and sometimes she's like, I've been talking to myself too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like, they, they're they so snarky with each other, that they, and that's some of my favorite. The The book itself can have some dark moments, but their, their banter, we need some levity in there, and uh, yeah, they're fun. <laughs> so in my mind, El- Elspeth is the type of person that things are happening to in this first book. Yes. Um, she has, she does still have a lot of agency, which is impressive because she's, she's just stuck in the middle of these circumstances. Yeah. Like she's, she can't tell anybody about who she is or that she has a nightmare in her head. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you balance that? <laughs> it was hard. Um, because like you said, it happens to her. She is not, you know, hoping to get attacked by highwaymen in chapter two <laughs> and like this whole ripple effect of collecting a deck of cards. She's just trying to get by. And I also, though, as particularly like a female protagonist wanted to give her agency, I don't want her to just be the like the sad vehicle of the story. She has to be her own person too. Um, It took, it took a while to, cause that's nuanced, right? That's hard. Um, and I I feel like some of the early drafts, I wasn't happy with the amount of agency she had. And one of my goals for myself, and even just talking to my agent when we were editing, talking to my editor was like, how um, how do we help Elspeth? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think I just needed to make her have like her own motives, which were always to be to try to have a normal life. She just doesn't know what a normal life is. And I think... I think readers can understand that they can know like someone can be a strong person and still um, struggle to know how to help themselves, like to have to go through and make mistakes and like fall down. Elspeth's always like falling down. <laughs> um, I don't know. I tried to make her real. I um, And so there's a, there's a lot of vulnerability in her. And I think actually 
that can just add to her agency too. Um, yeah, she was an interesting one to write. Um, I really hard. like the influence that the nightmare has on her, it, particularly in chapter two when she's attacked by the um, mm -hmm. highwaymen and she just kicks their butt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're like, what just happened? <laughs> yeah I like that part too I I that chapter was like like all books you know it goes through drafts that one was always there um where we get to understand what the nightmare can do and her just like I don't want your help I can do it myself and then he's like mm. <laughs> this one the, time though yeah the begrudging reliance upon him the begrudging codependence we're not looking like I'm not they're they're funny they're bantering but i'm not gonna say that it's super healthy you know uh, <laughs> at all but um yeah i like that part too um i like when we we finally like get it's revealed the capacity that he has as a monster and how that's also kind of scary yeah okay so let's talk about the cards real quick before we do anything else yes um so I love the magic system in this book so much. It Thank is you. just so fascinating. Uh, so there's 12 cards, and when somebody who's not magical touches them, they can get their power, right? Yes, there are. There's a deck of cards um, called Providence cards, but it's not just like a single deck. They There are, it goes down like um, in order, there's 12 starting with like 12 of a certain kind and one of the twin elders. So like there's in general, like over a hundred cards, but yes, there are um, 12 variations of them. And how it works is besides Elspeth, even some magic users, like who have the infection or have a different kind of ma magic, everyone in Blunder um, who decides to use these cards can touch them and they can get some sort of magical ability, quality, but there's always a catch with magic, so they can't use them too long. They cannot use the cards so long because otherwise they will incur some sort of negative effect. Um, and I wanted to have a magic system that really, really um, touched on magic comes at a cost um, and how, how, yes, it can be really wonderful, but it could also be horrific, like the toe the line between wonder and dread and horror. And... Um, they were really fun to to build out the deck of cards. Um, obviously, some of them are highlighted way more than others. There's like a few that I hardly talk about. There's like a golden egg card that like gives wealth. We don't talk about that. No one cares about that. But <laughs> yeah, building that that deck out and deciding which ones would do what and what the negative cost would be of using them was super, super fun. And I like that part a lot, too. Yeah. It's so well structured too for a magic system, which is, I I imagine it's because it's based off of these cards, and then you have the separate magic system where if people get sick as a child, yeah. they can develop strange uh, magics. Yes, and that that system like it was a clear like binary of like what is allowed, what isn't allowed. Like that, the infection magic system is basically like completely illegal in the kingdom, whereas. Um, I wanted, and then, yeah, where people can't help but get it, but they get it, and then the this, the card system is venerated. Everyone is, like, vying over the cards. There's, like, the dichotomy between good and bad magic, but not, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sets up a really great, um, like, class system, because yes. everybody who's wealthy has those cards, or yeah. you were trying really hard to get one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, not to give spoilers away, but even like the infection, it if you are a influential person, you can still like skate by with it versus everyone else, like like Elspeth, who just has to hide it and pretend and or else they'll be killed. Um, yeah, I wanted to do that. I wanted to kind of highlight the the class system within there. <laughs> um, so I really love it though because it it looking at these two types of magic one is like a genetic mutation almost and then the other one is like strict rules you have to touch a card if you're mm -hmm. not holding it anymore you don't have the power <laughs> um and I love that they're so different um mm -hmm. 
but very structured. I love the structure so much. I needed, I needed it because it is, it can be as, as I was writing it, you know, drafting it, it, it could have easily gotten confusing really, really, really fast. And it did for me, of course, like writing it. And I had to make the rules very clear. And once, I mean, it helps too, that they're a tangible object that you can use versus the infection where it's not, which is so muddled and like there's, but the cards themselves, the card system, tangible, tangible magic with a clear like cost, um, it's great. It's easy to understand. There's there's rules and in and magic in, in general can be a hard one to to convey. Um, I really yeah, and I, it came from a lot of inspirations. Um, tarot magic in general. I did a whole lot of or tarot like cards. I did a lot of research on how that all works and and like different decks of cards. And there's like um, the symbols on the cards. Um, yeah, it was fun to write. It was really fun. Um, so you also have the origins of the magic system in this book, which is fantastic. A book within a book. <laughs> yes. yes. The old book of Alders. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it has, like, it has extra, mm, I don't want to say extra magic, but it's like, like folklore almost in that, like. Um, it is yeah it's yeah. it's um what would i compare it to it's basically like a rule a guideline book of that was written hundreds of years ago for blunder when these cards were first created by the shepherd king the the king who created the cards and from the book um which if, if you read one dark window you've seen that they have they they made these really beautiful chapter headers with pieces of the the old book of alders and yeah it's just like a folkloric way of adding lore and also doing the world building in a way that wasn't just like and this is what happened 500 years ago and these are the rules of the kingdom but it was like a really fun way for me to just set the tone and each chapter header with a page from the old book of alders kind of like corresponds to that chapter and what happens talk about the cards in it you talk about the the deity which is the um, the spirit of the wood and yeah i it was it like like the cards and world building and fantasy in general i was like how do i build like a book within a book <laughs> yeah it's um, got to have been rough, though, because, like, some of them are really, really... So they're all poems, mm -hmm. essentially. So that's got to be hard, because you're writing poetry now, too, in this book. And I was <laughs> like, how are you doing all of this? <laughs> well, a poetry is... We'll, we'll call it a subjective term, because for me, at least, like, I, I kept the structure for the actual poems very controlled, which is, like, their, their like, five-line limericks and things like that, um, or their rhyming couplets. Like, uh, I actually... Some of those I I I wrote at the beginning and I never really had to touch because they're simple enough. Um, so I didn't have to rework them too much. I did. Uh, it just it just took time to to decide to decide what to to say about it all. But um, it was I liked it. I I really like. It. I don't know if I do it again if I'm writing a a big fantasy book to have a poem at the beginning of every chapter, but. <laughs> It, it it suited it very well. Yeah, I just imagine you had to have this entire other file system of just these. <laughs> my folders in my in my computer of just like I just have um, the old book of Alders folders, and there's the poem section, there's the card section, there's the like. Yeah, it was very complex, and I'm not super organized. I am like I know everything is, but I'm pretty chaotic minded. So yeah, it was pretty pretty crazy. <laughs> But all of this works so good and together with the town of Blunder to make this beautiful, beautiful setting, this like really gothic setting. And mm -hmm. everybody's kind of like, it's like tongue in cheek almost with they're like, oh, yeah, feigning maidens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think, it. yeah, the the I tried to subvert a few like expectations about like gothic themes while also being someone who loves gothic atmosphere as well. Um, and what I mean by subverting the expectation of a gothic theme is right, is kind of just like, 
the damsel in constant distress. And I'm like, she's certainly in distress in this one. Don't get me wrong. Um, but there's a catch, right? Um, she's got a monster in her head. And even also with just going into the idea of the maiden, um, the maiden card is supposed to be like this card of beautiful, a beautiful maiden, but also like it turn it can turn them into terrible people. Um, I don't know. I thought that was really, there's so many, I mean, the Gothic genre is wide enough where you can like take little things that you like and change them or keep them the same. For me, the things that I obviously kept the same were just like haunted castles, woods, all those things, very atmospheric, as I said, like the, like on the nose being haunted by something, which is her having the nightmare in her head. Um, but yeah, Gothic is so fun. I love it. I love watching it. I love reading it. I love everything about it. I know. I've never loved something like the aesthetic of something so much as Gothic. And mm -hmm. sometimes I get really annoyed because the like characters in movies or something will make a weird decision. And I'm like, why are you doing that though? That doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. But okay. here, especially with um, Elspeth's cousin who does like touch the maiden card it's so weird watching her want to have her own things and Elspeth even was like oh you're just my cousin you're always happy yeah. and then she's like yeah but I have dreams and ideas yeah she's like no <laughs> I'm not <laughs> right yes I love Ioni is a, it's a very she's a very much a side character in um One Dark Window but she is very important to um to understanding smaller aspects and nuanced aspects of the magic system and just like also side characters. I read, I saw this really like interesting thing about like writing and the craft and said side characters don't know that they're side characters. <laughs> and, uh, and Ioni certainly doesn't in her own mind is not a side character. Um, yeah. I love Ioni. She, uh, she gets her day in the sun in book two and, um, I'm excited for everyone to know her a little bit better. Um, but yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. How <laughs> <So> much longer? <laughs> uh, I I can't say. I can't say release date yet. Um, I can say that it is written. It is in. Um, it's not in copy edits yet. I'm still. I'm. I'm tweaking a few things. But I know how. I know how it all goes. <laughs> so does my editor. <laughs> yeah. Well. Uh, so I imagine the nightmare plays a huge part in book two. Um, but he does in the first book as well. Like he's, he's the second central character in my mind. <laughs> he is. I would argue, I mean, the series is called The Shepherd King. Um, I would argue he is, I mean, everything's opinion. I'm the writer and this is still an opinion. <laughs> I would argue it's his story. Um, I would argue, I mean, someone else is telling it and, and they don't even realize it. But um, I would say that this is very much his story. And he's just a quiet puppet master in throughout. Um, because obviously, well, I don't want to give too much away. <laughs> because I mean, you read it and we read it. So I feel like I'm discussing it. But also someone who's listening may not have. But um, yes, he's he's got layers to him. And um he does. Mm -hmm. um, even by the end of the book, I'm still thinking that there's many layers to go. <laughs> yeah, there is. Um, and book two, um, to to go off what you're saying, yes, we 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 get a lot more of him, and not just him in current day going through what's happening, but we learn about him 500 years ago. Um, yeah. I forgot that's how the cards were made too. He he makes a deal a deal with a witch, a bunch of deals, and he gives parts of himself away, right? Yes, he there's like the old deity that no one really pays attention to anymore in Elspeth's time, which is called the Spirit of the Wood, and she's like this forgotten invisible monster that lurks in the mist. And 500 years ago, she was very much like worshipped, which is why everyone in the series has the last name of a tree because they're just like paying homage to her anyways um yes he essentially the providence cards were created because the shepherd king 500 years ago like bartered away pieces of himself like things that he had to make 
incredible magic and um he did but everything comes at a price and um yeah and we'll we'll hear more about that in the sequel and yeah I just thought it was a really fascinating origin of the magic system Mm -hmm. Um, because he has to get and they're all like very logically chosen right like if he wants to be seen he has to give or the beauty one he had to give his skin or something which was yeah he did very like sheer off his hair, hair. yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> which i'm like oh but i loved the body horror but it was also <laughs> yeah 100 percent. i'm like that's rough as i'm writing it i'm just like oh <laughs> keep on going <laughs> just go just go it'll happen yeah <laughs> you don't yeah, have to make it happen much. which is funny because like i i'm a huge scaredy cat so the horror aspects of it they fit perfectly in my mind, but I'm also just like, don't dwell too long. You might get scared. <laughs> but you leave readers hanging for a little while with a lot of suspense. You're good at suspense. Thank you. Drawing uh, stuff out. Everyone's very mad at me for the cliffhanger. I'm not mad about, <laughs> I like, I love any mad, happy, whatever. Um, but yes, I would say the suspense aspect, particularly of this, the finale of book one is um, it's there. <laughs> Yeah, but there's even like the smaller moments when somebody's afraid to go into the woods because yeah. they're afraid they're going to get taken by the uh, by the spirit of the woods. Yeah, yeah, they're scared of the mist. The mist is not even like I just tried to make it an um like not describe it too much to just make it seem just like this ominous presence. Um, and I think that adds tension too because you don't know what's in it. You don't the, you can't see the spirit of the wood. You don't know what happens in the woods, but you're just like. <laughs> I don't, I don't like that. Um, yeah, all, there's a lot of things. I wouldn't want to live in Blunder. <laughs> oh gosh, no. But the, like the architecture seems very pretty. It would be you nice know. to pass through. <laughs> they have nice castles, like pretty, pretty things. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of ruins. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, exactly. That's that <laughs> Gothic element to it, which I adore. Um, so yeah. One thing I can't remember from the book, because I did read it in September, was do people come and visit Blunder from the outside world? They don't. It's very much, I call it, um, mist locked. Um, Like, the, it's too dead. Like, no one leaves Blunder. No one comes to Blunder. And it's been that way for hundreds of years to this, and, and, it's getting even smaller. Like the mist is this like choking claustrophobic presence. And so to collect all 12 Providence cards, they will be able to lift that mist. And the stakes are heightening because like, because blunder has been choked off by the outside world. Like they're, they're running out of like, I don't, when they talk about how their harvests are really poor, they're talking about how people are suffering. Basically, um, they need to lift the mist and they're just so isolated, um, which is, there's a lot of reasons why they want to collect the deck, but that's, that's certainly one of them. Yeah. And then Mm -hmm. I can definitely feel like the opposing force of people who want to collect the deck, but not necessarily to lift the mist. (laughs) Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. There's, And at least in um, Elspeth and her, her new cohort of friends um they want to lift the mist because or they want to collect the deck i should say um because it's also stated in the old book the 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 old book of alders that if you collect the deck you can heal your infection and she's like i can get the nightmare out of my head if i do this so she has her own reasons she doesn't so much care about the mist as much but (laughs) well she and her friends seem to be able to walk through it most of the time so you know If you have the infection, if you have like illegal magic, the mist doesn't doesn't bother you. But there's very few people like that. It's, and uh, of all the things, all the troubles Elspeth has, at least she doesn't have that one. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and then, but then that brings its own troubles because in the very beginning of the book, she's like walking alone by like along the road mm-hmm. through the woods, and people are like, "Oh, did you go by yourself?" Yeah. And she's like, oh, "I guess." <laughs> I mean, she's like, am I ever by myself? I don't know. (laughs) Um, So you have all of these really wonderful aspects of the story, but then you also added Raven, her love interest, (laughs) or her, I don't know, it's, he's a love interest eventually, but mostly he's like a, I want to avoid you. Yeah. Uh, 
he's definitely um a love interest <laughs> but <laughs> for us as the reader like you know we talk like as soon as he's on the page and you see his face and you're like okay yeah obviously he's gonna be the boyfriend but for <laughs> Elspeth no um not at the beginning and even Raven knowing who she is it's it's a reluctant sort of ally situation going on um and just like a beneficial mutual beneficial um alliance at the beginning for sure that yeah and but, he's yeah <laughs> he's part of this um this group of people with the name of which I cannot say it starts with a D. <laughs> oh yes. It's called Destriers. Um, it came from, it's, it's a French word for a, a war horse, like a black war horse. And they use the black horse card. So they're the Destriers. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but they're the ones who hunt down people with illnesses. Yeah. And so that's why she's avoiding him at the beginning. <laughs> yes. Oh yes. He's basically could arrest her, throw her in the dungeon, like right away. And we learn quickly that Raven has um, layers to him. He, I often talk about Raven and his cousin Elm and his sister Jesper, um, and they're as literal devices as highwaymen because they wear masks. But also, like I talk about him being like a statue and him wearing masks because he has parts of himself he likes to hide very much. Um, yes, he's a complex character. I like Raven a lot. Are you going to do like a Jesper short story or anything? Because I love her. <laughs> I love her too. I should. Um, I should. Jesper, I mean, all the characters that you know in book one are in book two. And yeah. um, <laughs> yes, I love Jesper so much. I need to like, she's, I would argue the only one who has a pretty like level head. <laughs> And then she's not distracted by anything. She's also more optimistic. Like Raven, super broody. Elm is constantly like snarky and on like, you know, just Elm's got problems, but <laughs> we love him too. But like Jesper's the one who's just like, I, she's reliable and we all need a Jesper. Um, yeah, I adore her. I was positive that I was going to hate Elm because he was so snarky like over the top snarky at the beginning and then I was like oh no that's just a coping mechanism no I get yeah. it now <laughs> yeah um I agree and Alma's another one where I was writing and he was just like I needed him to be okay like the the, the character of distrust who like kind of sees Elspeth for who she is but clearly also doesn't um but then as I'm writing him I'm like oh my word like he's traumatized he's delightful like <laughs> And um, yes, Elm also has his day in the sun in book two, and uh, we learn a lot more about him. I I don't have favorites. If I did, it might be obviously the nightmare, but Elm is up there as well. Um, yeah, I think he's great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I... Yeah. That's hard. I couldn't, I don't know that I could pick favorites, but like, yeah, you do spend more time with certain characters in the book. So you're more familiar with them. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it's a totally different experience, I imagine, as a reader versus as me, who's just like having to constantly dive into their psyche. Um, But yeah. Well, I imagine there's a lot of stuff that you have to think about that's not in the books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like we talked about my folder for the the Providence cards, et cetera, my like character folders are also very chaotic in that like they all have backstories. They all have like what are their motives, what are their weaknesses, what are their like blind spots. But on the page, if I were to write all of that, you would just be so sick of it and you'd be like, where's the plot? You know, so a lot of things don't make it onto the page. <laughs> I always yeah. kind of want to read the deleted scenes of books that I really love. Like, yeah, I wish that I was a thing. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, authors do it when they put it, they'll put on their newsletter and things like that. But like, you got to hunt for those if you really want them. And I like them, though. I like the scenes that didn't quite make it. And I want to be like, why? And uh, <laughs> sometimes you can tell why, because it's just kind of wallowing in an emotion too long. But I personally like that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, it is gothic, you know, you have to wallow a little. <laughs> oh, yes. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, your bio says that you teach too, right? I did. Um, it's a bit of an old bio that I will eventually get around to correcting. I was a preschool teacher for ages. Um, I wrote this when I was 
yeah, when I was teaching. So I was a bit of a wake up early and do some writing and then uh, go hang out with kids and then come back at, at a very different sort of atmospheres for sure. Of like, <laughs> oh, let's talk about the nightmare in my head and then let's go yeah. play with small, small children. <laughs> it would have been nice. He probably wouldn't have been a very good presence to have in my head when I was like in general, just but to like be around happy people, I wouldn't recommend having the nightmare on board. But yeah, I used to teach. Um, I originally thought I was going to teach older kids and then I just ended up in preschool because I loved it. Um, and then I, I stopped a couple years ago and I've been like, I have um, had a baby during you know, the pandemic also. And then, then it just kind of turned into writing became as full-time a gig as you can be when you're a stay at home mom. Um, and yeah, so I need to correct that bio, but I still, I love, maybe like when my kid gets to be of that age, I'm probably going to go back into it in some respect of just like, I don't know. It's good to have balance for me, at least like yeah. writing can be so, I talk about balance a lot in, in, in the book in one dark window, but like, I need it too. Like I, I can't just be all about writing. We need other things in our lives. Um, but Yeah. I went to school for writing and I was getting a master's degree in just writing. Oh yeah. And then I realized that my brain doesn't work that way. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> and I'm still learning this as someone who's now like when you write a debut, you have all the time in the world. Right. And now I, I have things like deadlines and like other projects that everything has to be very much the same way as in school where like, you have an assignment and this is when it's due. Yeah. And it's a different part of at least my brain to do that. Um, and I think maybe some part of me knew that because when I studied in school, I had the option of like do literary criticism or do creative writing. And I was, I was also just scared of sharing my work. So that's <laughs> at the time, which seems so silly now. <laughs> well, you've but, shared it to the best. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, I mean, I can totally understand why you would feel like oh I can't do it in the like in this structure um yeah I ended up taking a bunch of classes that were not in writing so that I would at least have something else to like fill out my brain yeah, yeah. otherwise you just get stuck and then you mm -mm. I, I found myself getting too critical I guess <laughs> that's hard and then you become your like own worst critic to the point where you even if someone gives you a positive critique you're like I don't buy it <laughs> You're just being nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's hard. I've been there. I, the the self-critical aspect of things, but you kind of have to do in some sense when you're yeah. editing your own work, right? You have to be homing through it critically, but slippery slope. <laughs> it's got to be so much different though with like an editor that you send your book off to. It is good <laughs> for me. <laughs> yes. I'm also very blessed because my agent um, was an editor for like a decade and so she before it even an editor got their hands on one dark window I, I had basically gone through an editorial process a few times with it um it's very very handy to feel like when you're writing um and you've lost objectivity in the sense of like I've written this book I have no idea if it's good anymore to hand it off to someone who can say they don't say no, first of all. Right. They're not like, no, it's absolute trash. But they, they can pinpoint the weak spots in a way that you no longer can. Um, yeah. I love that. Yeah, yeah. it's got to help too. You mentioned that like you needed help pulling Elspeth out of her, like everything happens to her. Yes. Um, yeah, so it's got to be nice to just have another set of eyes on things like that. Absolutely. And, and I asked, like, I put notes in my in my manuscripts too, when I ask like questions, I'll just be like, huh, Elspeth's agency, what should we do about this? You know, like I used to be in, uh, in book two stuff, I have all sorts of questions <laughs> and I'm like, does this make sense? So um, yeah, it's great. Well, uh, yeah, I don't know. Oh, Elspeth's dad. That was a bit of a bomb, eh? <laughs> her dad. <laughs> I wrote on a tangent of her dad. Um, <laughs> I wrote the whole book, obviously, and then I finished the book and it's done. And then I'm reading it. I'm like looking at scenes with Eric, her father and herself. I'm like, oh, 
she has daddy issues so bad. Like Raven is literally his replacement. <laughs> but he's hot. Obviously, we right? know she did. <laughs> but so on the top, I was like, wow, like she needs a therapist. Um yeah, her dad was her dad was always a a a, a very background character, almost like neglectful character, a sort of man who um which I guess I did do it on purpose. Like I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to show him as captain of the Destriers. It's just someone who's completely like unable to access his emotions. And like, yes, he made sure Elspeth didn't die, but he didn't know how to like be there for her, love her, support her. So he kind of gave her to her aunt and uncle versus then you see Raven as captain of the Destriers. And he's like, he seems to be all those things as well. But then you understand that like he's doing things for his own family um, in a way that Eric never did for Elspeth. And um, so there's that juxtaposition to daddy issues, as I say, but um, I like Eric. He, he's just there to be someone who really doesn't know how to like love her, but still not wanting her to like fall to the system that he's a part of. Yeah. So I think, his most defining character trait is that he loved his first wife so much mm -hmm. and his second wife hates that so much. <laughs> Poor Miriam. She's, she's got a chip on her shoulder. <laughs> she's an awful woman. She's, she's got, she's a pretty small character, but like she gives very much, like we're aware that this is like a wicked stepmother situation. Yeah. It's very like Grimm's fairy tale about, about her. She's a Cinderella stepmother in some ways. Um, yeah. She's rough. <laughs> We don't like her. Um, <laughs> yeah. I just love all these like characters. And even though these are really minor side characters, they have purpose. They have reason. They have like thoughts of their own. And sometimes when you get side characters in fantasy, they're just very, oh, he's a shopkeeper or, oh. <laughs> yeah. It's, I wanted to be, I mean, I wouldn't say Miriam and even her twin sisters, the little goofy ones, they don't really they're not exactly pushing the plot forward in any device. They're not a plot device, since the, but they are like an atmospheric device. But you do get the sense of like, if anything, the, the, the side characters are so vivacious because Elspeth isn't in some ways. Like the world is in color and she's kind of this like gray thing hiding because everyone's got something going on, but she's per so busy pretending she doesn't that like everyone else seems really vivacious. Um, even the bad ones, like like her stepmother, um, like her stepmother's jealousy is very palpable, and Elspeth is kind of just like, okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, I I like side writing side characters. I I'm as you can probably tell, like I want my stories in general to be um character based. Um, it's where I find the most interest in writing. So. Um, while the magic system is very complex in some ways and, and the, the world is atmospheric, like for me, I was like, these things will help make the characters more interesting. Um, and that's just how I write. Um, it can be tricky in fantasy. I think all books are that way, right? They're character driven, but people don't always know that they are. Yeah. Or that they should be. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. And maybe it's also sometimes a book is character driven, but I just don't connect to the character. Yeah. Who knows? Um, Yeah. I'm thinking very like Raymond Carver. I did not like his characters, but they're character driven stories. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. And I also feel like sometimes with like, there's just a different style for me reading sometimes fantasy written by women versus fantasy written by men. And I'm not saying one is better than the other whatsoever, but I know like for me, I, I can I can tell the difference in what my preference of how characters are written sometimes especially female characters but there are exceptions to all of that um yeah. I love like I love a lot of male writers or men writers uh, but like I do love women be writing because I'm like oh I actually have questions about like how women are surviving in these worlds and you might answer them I think about that all the time in fantasy <laughs> particularly like high fantasy <laughs> not even like the nitty-gritties of like when are they eating and bathing yeah. and all these things which is like so much female like portrayal in fantasy. I don't know. <laughs> it, 
it's like sex symbol and that's yes. like pretty much it we talk about i and by we i mean like myself and myself <laughs> but like talk about female gaze male gaze in any media but um fantasy particular and like seeing what the what the how the female characters are portrayed and i tried to um like highlight that with the maiden card in the sense of like it's a female i mean it, the card is used as like a very male gazy item which is like now you are beautiful now you are the <laughs> most beautiful um and i feel like char female characters in fantasy can just in generally be that maiden but um yeah try to make it also like but is that a good thing like <laughs> <laughs> or how can she use this as like a woman to I don't, I don't the mating card is important in book two so I also won't <laughs> talk about that but yeah um I got off on a tangent there but like yes women in fantasy male gaze female gaze describing men as a female writer describing women as like a female writer um it's fun yeah <laughs> yeah, and I can definitely see a shift. Like, um, I talked to Ari Salvatore last month about his uh, Drizzt books. He has the, like, D&D setting books. Okay. And he, he's been writing since the late 80s. And he's like, yeah, no, I was super sexist. Uh, I'm, it's good that I know these things now. <laughs> I mean, good on him for self-reflection and all those things. Like, <laughs> I, I can, obviously this is my first book and maybe in like 50 years I'll look back and or not, and <laughs> who knows? Like that's what hindsight's for, but. Um, Raven's too pretty. <laughs> Raven's too like asking too much. Uh, no, <laughs> but he, like I, I can see myself falling into traps of even like writing female characters and who knows? I, don't I think know. that's why I like Elspeth so much, though, because she is a person that things are happening to, but she does still have agency. I feel like I relate to Elspeth in the sense of, like, I um, am a more quiet, introverted, slow-moving person, and I love adventure stories. Um, however, I do imagine I would have to literally fall into one. I don't see myself going... <laughs> And I think there are a lot of us like that. <laughs> yes, and, yes. And it just kind of depends, like, okay, what are you going to make of this now? Like, this did happen. Circumstances are absolutely insane. Like, time to start making choices, Elspeth. Um, yeah. And she asked for help a lot. And she asked for help even to her own detriment. But I wouldn't say that makes her... Um, I wouldn't say that makes her like passive necessarily. It just makes her a product of her circumstances. Um, yeah. So what would you suggest people read in the interim between book one and two? Obviously nothing for me since I have nothing else out there, but as other like book recommendations. Oh, mm. oh, um, well, I would say if you want to stay in the same vein, um, comps that have been, given a lot for One Dark Window are Hannah Witten's um, duology, which is for the wolf or for the wolf and for the throne. Um, and then we also used, and I love this book, um, Uprooted by Naomi Novik. Um, both of those have like the creepy woods vibes. I wouldn't call either of them gothic per se, um, but a lot of the similar vibes, like some dark magic, um, elements of horror, um, elements of romance. And um, One Dark Window is interesting too because it is the, my, it's Orbit is my publisher. It's an adult imprint, but Elspeth is 20 and she's young. And so I also see it called young adult often. Um, and and there's reasons for that. And I'm not going to be the one who's like, this is where you have to draw the line. This is adult. This is young adult, whatever. But um, as far as like young adult, um, if you want to read that and something comparable, um, I actually haven't read all of it yet, but I'm reading Belladonna by Adeline Grace, which is has a lot of gothic elements as well to it. And um, yeah, I'm always in the 
in the market to read something with spooky woods and, um, <laughs> you know, fantasy elements like that. So anyone wants to come and share those with me too, I would love them. Um, but I'm, I'm currently stacking up my, my reading list because I am finishing edits and I haven't gotten to read for fun in a while. So I'm also stacking up like cozy fantasies because <laughs> the dark stuff, sometimes you're like, oh, I'm so stressed constantly. Um, Orbit has put out some really good cozy fantasies lately too. I've read um, The Undertaking of Heart and Mercy by um, Megan Bannon that I um, read a couple months ago. Very cozy, still high fantasy, still like romance and weird stuff, but I don't know uplifting it doesn't it's a standalone also <laughs> well so i went from legends and lattes to your book and then a bunch of um like really gothic literature i think i was following a trend <laughs> it was it was certainly a trend this fall yeah. Um, but yeah legends and lattes are just like oh so my so heart sweet. and then and you're like wait a minute <laughs> every gothic stuff way more blood drenched and like things like that yeah, I can see that being a little jarring. Yeah, but I loved it. It was great. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, so One Dark Window is out already. It came out in October. Right. It came out in it came out in late September. Um, oh. Okay. But they, it was. It's not your. It was. Um, it was slotted to come out in all the galleys and everything said October, but then it got pushed up because I was lucky enough to get, um, it was the Barnes and Noble monthly pick. And so for October, so in order for it to be that it had to come out earlier. Um, but yes, it's been out since fall and it's available wherever you want to shop for books. Uh, I, I love it so much. And I think anybody who reads it will love it. Honestly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I love talking about it. Yeah. Well, I will keep a lookout for your next book. Do you have a title for it yet? I do, but I'm not oh. able to say. I <laughs> imagine we will be hearing title, we will be seeing cover, and we will be um, getting a release date fairly soon. Um yeah. I mean, it literally just came out. I can't complain. I really can't. <laughs> I do know, though, like like some duologies, my mine also will likely be they will be a year apart. So, I yeah, mean, we okay. won't be waiting forever for the sequel. Um, but <laughs> I'm really excited about it. I've been like drawing in my spare time some some fun character stuff oh. for it. So maybe I'll just put some things out. <laughs> Who knows? Do you have an author website now? I do. Um. I don't use it very much. It's, <laughs> it's um, <laughs> it's just like rachelgillig.com. I'm mostly on Instagram. I um, I'm almost never on Twitter. And then I, I have a TikTok that I sometimes check in on. So I'm I'm out there. Um, but I would say almost all my book stuff announcements wise will will first be on Instagram and then trickle into the others. Um, Fantastic. <laughs> Well, thank you again for being here. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you for having me. And uh, I enjoyed it too. And have a great rest of your day. <laughs> yeah. And if anybody who's listening hasn't wa hasn't read it, watched it, uh, go, go check out One Dark Window. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Bye.